Hello everyone and welcome to October's edition of Talking Maths in Not Quite Lockdown. Um, for those I think all of you have been with us before at some point but as a reminder uh, myself, Katie, Kevin and Ben make up Talking Maths in Public which is not so much just a conference for maths communicators but also a bit of a support group and we've been doing these Talking Maths in Lockdown sessions um, since March, April time when lockdown started. Um, today's session is all about GeoGebra and it will not be the same format as the sessions we've had before where we've had more of a panel discussion and things like that. This will be more of a workshop so you will actually have to do stuff although we're not actually looking over your shoulders on your computers and we won't know if you've done it or not um, so you can join in as little or as much as you like as a reminder we are recording these sessions so if you don't want to be recorded turn off your mic turn off your camera um, if you have any questions at any point that you want to ask but you don't want to be the one to ask them, stick them in the chat or send them to us directly and we will get them asked for you. Um, please make sure that you are following our code of conduct at all times. So our code of conduct is here. Um, essentially, be kind to people, use inclusive language, um, make sure you're not sort of inadvertently saying things that might be offensive or upsetting to anyone and just, just have a good time really. Um, is there anything else I need to tell you? Oh yes, uh, some people might be sharing some things within the call that they don't want to be shared more widely. So if you see anything either in it or that someone says that they're sharing and you want to share it beyond today, do ask them first, please, um, just in case it's not possible for that to be shared more widely. And with that, I think we'll introduce ourselves before we get cracking with what's happening today. So my name is Sam Durbin. I work at the Royal Institution. I am currently on furlough for just the last couple of days and then back in November, at which point I'll go back to my normal day job of looking after the secondary maths masterclasses all around the country. Um, Katie, do you want to introduce yourself? Can do, yeah. Um, I'm Katie Stackles. I'm a mathematician who talks about maths for a living, so I do talks and workshops increasingly online, uh, do bits of writing about maths and bits of lecturing at universities and whatever else people will ask me to do. Uh, and I will pass on to Kevin. All right, hello. Yes, I'm Kevin Houston. I'm the, um, um, well, I'm a lecturer at the University of Leeds and I'm the Education Secretary of the London Mathematical Society. Um, and I do bits and pieces in uh, for for that. I do bits and pieces for outreach and public engagement. So uh, I guess I hand over to Ben now. Yes. Ben. Hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm also one of the team team, as you will have already known. I work for the AMSP, the Advanced Mass Support Program, for half of my time. I'm based at the University of Bath, and I teach on a mass communication course there. And I'm freelance doing similar stuff to Katie, for example, in sort of mass communication world. And as similar to Kevin, best described as bits and pieces, I think. Uh, but in this case, bits and pieces to do with mass education and outreach, particularly occasionally including things like YouTube with number file. Uh, but I also enjoy quite a lot of my time tinkering on a piece of software called GeoGebra. Coincidentally, we're going to look at that later on. Good. Um, so I can introduce uh, our speakers for today. So uh, to, to give you a sense of what this session is about. So if you do not know what GeoGebra is, brave uh, coming to a session with absolutely no knowledge of what it is about. But this um, it's a, a dynamic geometry tool. So it's a piece of software uh, which allows you to make constructions and kind of manipulate things geometrically and do lots of interesting math stuff. Um, and it's increasingly helpful in learning and teaching in the, the world of doing a lot of things online because um, it's got lots of nice features that you can use to do that. Um, and it's really great for demonstrating things. So we thought it would be useful for people to put together a session in which you can just have a bit of a play with it. Um, and I'm hoping that people either have a little bit of experience of GeoGebra, I guess to be essentially in the same situation as me, which is that I am aware that GeoGebra is a thing and I've seen some really cool things done on GeoGebra, but I wouldn't have a clue how to create those things. And I've done bits of clicking around and sort of modifying other people's GeoGebras, but not really got a handle on it myself. So if you're in that situation, don't worry, that is the perfect level. Um, if you've got a bit more experience of GeoGebra, then that's fantastic. And you might even be able to chip in and contribute as well. 
So um, I'm going to hand over um, to Ben, who's got a plan, I believe, for what's going to happen in the session. But as you say, it's more of a workshop than a panel thing. So you might be asked to do stuff yourselves and get involved. Okay. Let me uh, quickly say hi to Becky, because it's very much uh, going to be the two of us leading this session. So I've mentioned my background already. Becky, is it is it fair to ask you to say 30 seconds about your background? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I used to be a maths teacher and I've just started a new job as a data analyst. But in, in the gap in between, um, actually, I, my, my joke was start. We'll go into this more later. Anyway, um, in the gap between I've done um, a lot of different freelancing maths education stuff written some um, resources for MEI uh, made videos but the thing that I've been doing most recently is online JoJibra for artists course um, so yeah I think that's I think that's why I've been invited to talk today it is indeed I'm glad we agree on that <laughs> but also Becky knows what's going on with JoJibra in general and with maths in general so we're really glad to have her more from her in detail in a moment um, I am going to reiterate what Katie said, which is that this is going to be at least in part a hands on workshop we would like you to get involved and I'll show you how you're going to do that in a moment. Although there also will be some demonstrations we are trying to find the balance between showcasing what Jojibra can do uh, and giving you time to tinker with it, which is almost always the only way to learn a new piece of software is tinkering time. We cannot give you enough tinkering time in this meeting uh, that you will never have enough tinkering time, but we'll give you a chance to tinker with some guided tasks. And we recommend that if you think it's going to be useful that you go and find some other tinkering time. Uh, by way of introduction, let me show you what the JoJibra sort of starting point looks like. And then I'll show you a quick demo and then give you a task to do. So I'm going to share a a random web browser screen. I just confirmed that you're seeing a, a Google page. Uh, anyone who's on video, if you're nodding that. So if you type in Jojibra to any Google thing, uh, jojibra.org, you come to a website that looks like this. This is where Jojibra lives. And you can, in fact, start a calculator by clicking on that button there, and you get a diagram that looks like this. This is running in a browser. There is no download happening. That said, the browser version, this happens to be the calculator suite or the graphing calculator, has got some limitations and there are lots of versions of Jojibra. It is a bit of a sore point for people starting off with Jojibra is there's lots of different versions. I will happily talk about that, but I don't want to complicate things. So for the sake of today, I'm not going to be using that particular version. And if you're interested, I'm going to be using one that would be called Jojibra Classic. And I would probably want to be using, if you click on the download, there's loads of options here. Jojibra Classic 5 would be the version I would prefer to use. There are all sorts of problems with there being lots of versions. I'll get into that discussion later on if anyone wants me to, but I'm going to try and avoid that. What I'd like to do first, though, is uh, stop sharing this screen and just show you one example use of Jojibra for something extremely basic. And remember, we're trying to find the balance between teaching you how to work this software and also showing you inspiring examples and Becky's going to show you some inspiring examples this one I'm not going to claim is inspiring but I do think it's important so bear with me here I'm going to share a Jojibra Classic 5 screen it should look fairly boring uh, it looks a little bit different from the web interface but it's essentially the same give me a nod on video if you are seeing that good thank you I'm going to type in a classic piece of mass education I'm aware that I'm not just talking to teachers here, but inevitably when we're demonstrating mathematics, it's sort of there's an overlap with the skills needed for a teacher. So let me show you something which is classic piece of school maths. I'm, I'm typing into the input bar at the bottom. I'm typing y equals, which means <laughs> Jojiba recognizes y as a, a piece of coordinate axis sort of uh, notation. I'm going to type in m times x plus c. I hope that is a familiar setup. That's the sort of British uh, sort of standard for a straight line graph. So when I press return, I don't think it should be too much of a surprise if Jojibra plots me a straight line. However, first two comments is that it's colored Y and X in different colors. It recognizes those letters as the standard notation for the uh, Y axis and the X axis. And M and C is colored gray. That's because it doesn't know what those things are. As far as it's concerned, they're just letters. In particular, they're not numbers. So when I ask Jojibra to plot this, like any computer software, it should complain. It should say, I don't know what M and C are. In this case though, Jojibra actually reacts slightly differently. When I press return, it says, do you want to create sliders for C and M? And I wanted to show you this first of all, because having variables is a crucial part of mathematics and it's also a crucial part of Jojibra. In particular, these variables or parameters or algebraic representations, C and M, 
uh, if I create them as sliders, we'll have a visual representation. So first of all, it's plotted a line. In fact, it's plotted the line y equals x plus one. That's because at the moment c and m are one, but I can change these values. And since this is the heart of GeoGebra, not only can I plot things, I can make them move. So if I drag m, before I drag it, I would like you to consider what's going to happen when I drag this m, it's going to change the value of m and this line will change. I, I'm not going to give you time to type in the chat box because I think a lot of you are very familiar with this piece of maths, but I'd like you to predict nevertheless, if I drag m to the right, what will happen? Hold it in your head. And lo and behold, something probably like what you were expecting is happening. And if I drag it to the left, it goes down that way. In fact, to save my uh, thumb clicking, I'm just going to right click on it and click on animation on, and then I'm just going to walk away. And genuinely, I wanted to show you this example because uh, I once had to walk into a year seven lesson that I had to cover in maths. They were doing straight line equations and I had no chance to plan a lesson. Walked into the room, typed in y equals mx plus c to GeoGebra and then animated m. I just left it on the board as they were coming in. And the bulk of the lesson was us discussing what happened next. In particular, I want to make the point that using GeoGebra to draw this straight line lets you make it move. And suddenly the movement makes people discuss mathematics. For example, one of the comments I had immediately from one of the year sevens in the room was, sir, why does it go quicker when it's flatter? I just want you to decide if you agree. Is that line moving quicker in some way when it's flatter? Does it seem to slow down when it gets steep? Uh, and the answer is yes and no. And we had a whole lot of discussion about it. It's all, we, we, we didn't get into the, uh, the gradient of line being correlated to the tangent of the angle, uh, although it is, but there's all sorts of depth coming on. And my first point is that if you make something move mathematically, you provoke discussion, uh, whether this is for educational purposes or inspirational purposes, or whether sort of just sharing interesting ideas, it is pretty powerful. So the reason why I think this session on GeoGebra is important is not because GeoGebra is important, it's that if we can make maths dynamic, we have a very powerful tool and GeoGebra is a freely available way to do it. There are other tools, for example, Desmos, which we should probably do another talking maths in lockdown session on. Uh, obviously you're crying out for me to animate the other one as well. So let's just leave this going. And that just basically caused everyone's head to explode in the year seven <laughs> lesson we were talking about. Making maths move is what this session is about. And it happens to be, we're gonna work on GeoGebra to do that. And I would like to give you a couple of exercises to work on in GeoGebra in order to get to know the tools. Once you know the tools, the creativity is the only thing um, that limits you. So you just need to come up with something like any old tool. It's a little bit like programming with geometry and Becky's gonna show you some more artistic examples of that. Before I leave this particular example, are there any questions about what I've just built in GeoGebra now? If there are questions about how did you do that, save them, but I will give time in the chat if anyone wants to put anything in there now. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to crack on with a different task. So I am going to give you a maths question and you are going to have a chance to build this file in a moment yourself, but I would like you to just watch this for now. I, I'm going to build something. Please don't try and copy this while I'm doing it. You will inevitably be looking at your screen uh, while if you're trying to copy this uh, and you won't notice what I'm doing. I'm going to give you a chance to copy this, but I'm going to share a screen again. And this is going to be a another George for Classic 5 screen that's sort of just blank. And I'm going to build a triangle. I'm going to do that by clicking on the polygon tool. And I hope you realize if you hover over a tool, it tells you how to use it. Uh, first tip for learning how to do something is make sure you read documentation. In GeoGebra's case, whether you lose, use the online version or the classic one, there are tool tips available. They tell you how to use things. So I'm going to draw a triangle. And it says to draw a polygon, I select all vertices and then the first vertex again. Uh, if I was feeling patronizing mood, I would ask someone to tell me what to do, but I think you'd probably tell me to click three corners and then finish it by clicking the first vertex again. And lo and behold, there is a triangle. First comment though, this is not just that triangle because this is a triangle on a dynamic geometry package. So it means it's actually any triangle and I can move this around and I have genuinely a general triangle available to me. That's the difference between what the Greeks were doing, scratching into stone these triangles and what we can do on a dynamic piece of geometry. Okay, I would like all of you now, this is the most exciting interaction you'll have all day, to point to the screen. I will see you, you're on camera. I'm not going to be able to see where you're pointing accurately, but I'd like you to point to the center of that triangle. I am being deliberately vague, you might know where this is going. But the reason I'm asking you to point is that you had a commitment to make about where the center was, you had some intuition, uh, and I would ask someone, I'm going to pick on Sam, I'm sorry to do this to you Sam, would you be happy to tell me in words, if you turn your microphone on, 
where you thought the centre was roughly and why. I thought it was in the middle. Sorry, I couldn't resist saying that. Um, <laughs> I agree. I think a lot of people are thinking like, why, why would it be anywhere else, Ben? Whereabouts uh, in the middle? You... About there? You About there, yeah. About there? No, about the first one. It was about there. Did about you have there. any reason for picking that one? Uh, it's about halfway along each of the lines. Ah, so you were thinking about midpoints of these I segments. was. In that case, let's ask you to build those midpoints. I'm going to this menu, going to the midpoint tool. Oh, look, there's a tool. If you want to know how to use a tool, hover over it. Select two points. Okay, I'll select A and B. And it's made the midpoint, which is Sam has just referred to. I'm going to do that for another one here. So that's not defining a centre, Sam. So say a little bit more. By the way, I do realise there are two Sams in the room and I didn't make it clear, but luckily one of them answered, so that's okay. I Sorry, should have Sam. stayed quiet and let the other Sam answer. Um, if you then join up the midpoint of a line with its opposite corner, where those further three lines intersect was about where I was thinking. So that diagram. Yeah, ah, but with so the other the with the other want... line as well. Wait, hold on a minute. Let me just make something profoundly obvious to everyone. If you draw two lines on a screen, the fact that they intersect is not a surprise. At least I hope it's not to anyone who's done a little bit of playing with lines. As However, long as they're not parallel. Agreed. There is a possibility that they don't intersect, but if they're not parallel, they will intersect somewhere. In fact, if I draw line segments, maybe we're dodging the issue. Maybe they won't intersect. But if I draw three lines, there is no reason why they would intersect in the same place. And yet, if I click the third line in here, it does look like they intersect in the same place. And that is a shock. It also means this center is an important point. Uh, and by the way, remember, this is not just any particular triangle. This is all possible triangles because this moves with it. And again, I'm going to keep do doing this movement to remind you that the reason to use GeoGebra or Desmos is that it's dynamic. It's general. This is not just true for the one drawing I've done. It's for all of them. So this point that we've just created is a center of this triangle, but it is not the only one. In fact, Sam, I agree, this is the center and it has a particular sense. This is called the centroid. It is the center of mass of this triangle. Other options are available. So to cut a long story short, I'm going to, here's one I made earlier moment with my blue Peter sort of best hat on. I'm going to go to my uh, second screen over here and show you a file, which I am going to give you a chance to play with in a moment. So this is the demo file I made in Jojibra. I'm not going to go into great detail about how I made it, but I'm going to give you a chance to try and make it in a moment. Can you confirm you're seeing a blank looking triangle on the screen at the moment? Nod if you can. So what we just built earlier was the centroid, and I've got a tick box to show that, and it's made by joining the medians, if you like, medians being the midpoints to the opposite corners, which Sam described. There are other options for the center of a triangle. For example, I could maybe do the uh, perpendicular bisectors of the sides. And if you do that, they all meet at a point. In fact, that one's called the circumcenter. And it is, in fact, the center of the circle around a triangle. And every triangle has a circle. It's called the circumcircle. And it has a center of that circle. But this center of the triangle can be outside the triangle, which is slightly alarming for people who were pointing to the middle of the triangle. That is also not the only option. Maybe another option could be, and if I had longer, I'd love to get you to suggest things. But instead of bisecting the sides, I could bisect the angles. So I could bisect the angles like that, and then I get an in-center, which is the center of a different circle. In fact, it's the center of the in-circle, which stays inside the triangle at all times. And again, I want to move this around to show that this is not just one triangle. This is all triangles have these properties. So to cut a long story short, I could wax lyrical about centers of triangles. Lots of them are available. In fact, the Wikipedia page on centers of triangles has uh, a frightening number of centers. But there are four in particular which are quite well known. The in-center, the uh, ortho-center, which is the center of the altitudes, where you drop perpendiculars from coin corners to the opposite side, and the centroid. So those four are famous centers. And if I just uh, hide some of the rest of them, these, they, they're all different places. So basically, I'm saying wherever you pointed at the triangle, you're probably close to one of these centers. But building this in GeoGebra and making it dynamic is quite a good exercise to get used to the geometric aspect of GeoGebra. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to share a link. In fact, if someone in the um, team could paste the link to a GeoGebra classroom page for me into the chat. What I've done is given you access to a, what GeoGebra also do is provide a classroom environment where you can ask people to go and have a play. And I can see what you're doing, uh, which made me wince earlier when Sam said, we're not going to be watching over your shoulder. I actually am in this case. So that link is now in the classroom. I'd like you to click on that. You're going to have to type in your name. Uh, and once you're in there, I would like you to click through and follow. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. 
follow the instructions. The first task you get to see will be the file I was just playing with. So you can have a play with that. And the second task is a blank triangle. And I would like you to try and build your own centers of triangles. You can do the centroid like Sam just did. You can try and do the in center, which is the center of the in circle. And that's coming from angle bisectors. And you're gonna to have to experiment with the tools available to you to do that. I'm not gonna say any more. I wanna give you a full five minutes where I shut up. Uh, but I will come back in five minutes and see how you're getting on. At any point, if you want to jump on a mic and ask a question, you will have to do that publicly. It's not like I can just sidle over to you and uh, whisper to you, but please feel free to do that. I'm going to stop talking for five minutes. Build your own centres of triangles. Do we get background music? Do you want background music? Careful. There's some nodding going on. <laughs> I, I fear I should spare you that so no but hey thanks for the request i'm going to stop talking for a bit everyone's at different levels of expertise here there are two questions about this task uh task three and task four they should be on the same page as the the task you're working on feel free to put responses to that if you wish but that is not compulsory i would suggest not going beyond that there's a stay on the triangle blank activity for now I would just like to say, Fran, I really enjoyed what I saw from your construction just there. That was looking good. Or maybe I'm looking at the wrong page. But... Can I ask a question, Ben? I you got, can indeed. I got to the point, um, so I constructed the perpendicular bisectors. I can see that. Well the done. point where they intersected. Yeah. And then I tried to get hold of like a point A, B or C and move it. And it didn't do what I thought it was going to do. So Good. I was like, I'm, oh. I'm glad someone asked that. And everyone else can either listen to what I'm saying or carry on tinkering. You need to make sure to move a point that you are on the select tool, which is the arrow tool on the far left of the toolbar. And there is a shortcut available to get you to that because you want to go back to that tool repeatedly all the time. So pressing escape, if you're in a Jojiba window, will jump you back to that tool. And that is super helpful. I basically yeah. hover over the escape button all the time when I'm working. Very much indeed. Tell me if that works. That's a really good tip, but I didn't know. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I've taught Becky something. Yes. How do you find the center of a circle you've just made? Indeed. How do you, Matza? I'm doing full teacher mode here. If a circle is on the screen, uh, where is the center? Now, this is actually a classic A-level algebra question, uh, but let me give you one option. You know about circle theorems. Uh, you know that chords of a circle and the perpendicular bisectors of a chord always go through the center. So here's one option. Draw two chords on that circle and bisect them. Mm -hmm. They will intersect at the center. In fact, what you'll be doing is very, very close to finding the circumcircle of a triangle. So there's not, not a special button to click on the circle and go, show me the center. There, you, could, you could make one in GeoGebra. But what's interesting about working in GeoGebra is that you have to be doing maths in order to construct stuff. This is not the same as drawing stuff. This is construction. And a lot of you are realizing that from what I'm seeing now. Mm -hmm. I am going to stop you. And I'm sorry this is going to frustrate you. GeoGebra Classroom does give me a pause button. I'm just watching your faces. And all of you are looking slightly frustrated that I've stopped you interacting with GeoGebra. Uh, this is something they borrowed from Desmos Classroom. I will come back to another chance to play with GeoGebra Classroom in a bit. First of all, though, let me share you something slightly meta. Uh, what I'm seeing is this screen here. Let me just share my screen. So if you could come back to a Zoom window, um, give me a nod on the video if you are seeing a screen that says task two. So I, I've anonymized all your names. This is a bit like Desmos if you play with that. And I can see that everyone's been working. I see student number four has uh, played with the buttons, making some polygons. Thank you, student number four. Let me uh, zoom in on student number 10 because I like what happened here. I I think I know who this is, but uh, you can own up later on. I can have a look at what everyone's working on, which is really lovely from an online teaching point of view or enrichment point of view. But I can also interact with the file here that student uh, 10 has played with. And can you see uh, something I wanted to point out here? First of all, they've made J, which is what they, I think they've made the circumcenter. That's from the perpendicular bisectors. They've also made H, which is the in center, but the in circle is not quite working, which is annoying. And I hope the person who actually made this is feeling the annoyance. Because I want to make a final point before I hand over to Becky here is that when you're working in Jojo with geometry, you are needing to construct rather than draw. 
and that difference is subtle and inherently mathematical and difficult to explain. Uh, but once you've experienced this problem, you really know what we're talking about. So what this person has done is drawn the center, they've constructed the in-center, and there, there is the center of an in-circle. But when they try and draw the circle, they have just drawn it, and this I dot is not in the right place. So allow me to do one further demo of this. Let me just bring up a new JoJava file. Now, give it a moment, you're seeing the file I started demonstrating on earlier. Lovely. So I'm actually going to, in JoJava, you can hide and show things. Uh, I'm just going to turn off all the things I built earlier, which are all these buttons. These little buttons on the left, they don't crash on me. That's unexpected. I just turn these buttons off and they disappear. Uh, so that those little blue buttons are hide show buttons. Actually, I wanted the triangle to remain. So I'm going to build the angle bisectors very quickly using the angle bisector tool. We could talk lots about all these tools, but let's just do a couple of them. Angle bisector again. And this will build the end center where they meet. But if I just draw, oh, I missed there. I need to uh, delete that. If I construct the intersection of those two, then the circle I want does seem to look like this. Where, where I click now will define the edge of the circle. And I need to know where it has to touch and what the person we did before clicked in somewhat arbitrary, they just drew it so it looked right. So the, the question is, how do you mathematically know where this circle touches? The answer to cut a long story short is that it must be the closest distance from H to one of these sides, which is actually gonna be tied up with a perpendicular. So if I construct the point it must touch by clicking that point and this line is giving me the perpendicular, I want the circle to touch at that point, which I missed again. But then I can build the circle, which is centered there and touches that point. And now when I move it around, the in circle moves with it. So I wanted you to experience some of this frustration. And the fact that you're different, you're not drawing, you're constructing is actually a helpful thing George teaches you, but it is quite frustrating until you get the hang of it. Okay, quick summary of what I've shown you. Uh, I've shown you that Jojibra does geometry, basically. I've shown you Jojibra Classroom works, and you can use that in an online environment to see what everyone else is doing. And I have given you a chance to tinker, not long enough. There will be another chance later on, but that was our first introduction. And I'm gonna stop talking now and hand over to Becky, if that's all right, because what I'd like her to show you uh, is sort of fast forwarding when you've done enough of working with the tools, what you can end up doing just for the hell of it in Jojibra to make some lovely pictures. Is that okay, Becky? All good. Yep. Um, so, I mean, to be honest, I'm just going to carry on from what Ben has said, because um, the, the reason I have been using GeoGebra to create art um, is because of its the, the, the construction that you can do. So on, on a computer, on other, you know, um, image editing programs and things like that, um, there, are, there are some simple, you know, geometric tools that you can use. You can often rotate or reflect things, um, but it doesn't have the full, you know, suite of construction things. So um, I've been using GeoGebra since um, I was a teacher, but um, over lockdown, there was a lot of kind of math art, maths art um, challenges and things like that. And, and I've, I've moved to America um, and I didn't bring a lot of my artistic stuff with me. So I kind of used what I had. And one of the things I had was GeoGebra. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of demonstrations, um, uh, one slightly more simple and a slightly more complicated one, just to kind of show you some things. Um, like, as Ben said, um, I, I wouldn't recommend following along um, because I will go reasonably fast. However, these are, these are being recorded. So if you want to kind of go back um, and with the pause button, you can kind of go through and see how I've constructed some of these designs. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I'm going to do a demonstration and I'm going to I'm going to talk, carry on talking over the top. Um, so can you all see my GeoGebra window? I can see um, it. Good. OK, so with the tools here, we've got, um, you know, point tool, circle tool, um, line tool. So anything that you can construct with um, a ruler and kind of using those tools, you can also do in GeoGebra. Um, but the nice thing about GeoGebra is that you can do some shortcuts. Um, so for example, I do quite like the regular polygon tool. Um, so rather than, so for example, a, a polygon I could construct using a ruler and compass is a 12 sided polygon. Um, but I'm just going to, you know, do a quick, um, oh, I think I've shared the, the, 
the dirigible window. So there is a pop up where I type in the number of vertices because I haven't shared my screen as such. Um, so I just typed in the box, um, the number of vertices I want is 12. So here we go, I've got a nice dodecagon. Um, and um, I actually am just going to use this to kind of be the basis of my design. Um, I'm going to use the polygon tool and I'm just going to do a quick um, star. So I just, you know, I'm building my polygons. This is kind of, kind of like, you know, the undo button is my friend here. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So, you know, not only can we do um, geometric designs, but yeah, the ability to kind of, un have I done it wrong again? I think I have. I think I can, if I click, I can undo some of these. Um, oh dear. Okay, I'll choose a different star, you know, that you can do a star that I can see a bit better. Um, I'm gonna do the star that's made up of um, equilateral triangles. So uh, in Georgia, but there's always multiple ways of doing things. So I could have started with an equilateral triangle and rotated it. I've got this nice 12 pointed star. And then what I like to do um, is, I'm gonna do some um, transformations in a minute. Um, hmm. I, seem to have, I seem to have colored my polygon. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so um, I, I started using GeoGebra to create some artistic designs and it kind of got a little bit of interest. And so I, I set up a, a, an online course uh, to teach people how to do the things that I do. Well, no, not really. Um, it was kind of using art, artistic designs, um, geometric designs to um, learn about GeoGebra. Um, oh, I can see. So um, as Ben was saying about constructions, I've managed to miss um, a point here. So this is a kind of a drawing point rather than um, a construction point, but I can just do a quick fix. So this is the other thing about GeoGebra is that um, because we can fix it as we go along, it gives us kind of a bit more flexibility. Um, so I'm just going to quickly redefine. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm just very giving a brief overview of um, the kinds of things that I've used Joji before recently. Um, and it, I, I've, I've spent some time exploring some of the tools, um, but um, it's very powerful. I think that, and we can use, we can use some of these, um, so here I'm using the translate by vector tool um, to got my basic shape. I can, you know, I can, you know, in this case, tile it in a particular um, pattern. Um, so I, yeah, this is just a kind of, um, kind of the kinds of things that you can do in GeoGebra. Wrote down some things I said I was gonna say. Um, so yeah, so I, I started using GeoGebra because um, in lockdown, because I didn't have a lot of um, tools with me and so this was kind of like, you know, JJB is free and, you know, you can do all the constructions and you can play around as well. So it does, you know, if you make a mistake, it's very easy to undo. Whereas if you've, you know, drawn something on a page and, you know, if trying to fix it can be quite messy. Um, so here I, you know, once I've constructed one part, doing the transformations to create all the other parts can be quite quick. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of using the basic geometry tools. And in some ways that's not, that's not the most powerful aspect of GeoGebra, but it does allow you to be incredibly precise with your kind of ma mathematical construction. So um, a lot of, for example, Islamic designs are based on, you know, ruler and compass constructions. Um, and, you know, if you do it, um, if you do it, you know, like this, then you get the very precise things rather than, you know, if you're using other image editing software, um, you know, you can kind of click things together and do some of it, but it's kind of the power in this is the mathematical nature of it. So you can create these beautiful designs very precisely um, and often much quicker than you can um, by hand. 
So that was just a quick um, demo of how, how quick it is to build something, you know, a, a simple repeating pattern. I wanted to kind of um, show you some inspiration. So I'm going to um, stop sharing that screen and um, I've got a little PowerPoint presenter presentation to share. So um, I'm going to just quickly start with that. So here um, I've started with, these are two pentagons that I've rotated um, round. So I've got a kind of 10 pointed shape and I'm going to kind of go through this quite quickly and kind of talk over it. Um, but obviously again, there's all the- I can't see. see what you can see, I don't think. Oh, hang on a second. Thank you. Uh, let me just- I think Just the, uh, the share screen has gone, that's all. Yeah, I'll just- uh, might be worth turning off your video as well. You're um, breaking up slightly again. Yeah, let me see if I can do that. Um, here we go. Okay. So here we go. Here are my pentagons that I was just mentioning. Um, and I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this. So this is an Islamic, a traditional Islamic design. Um, and um, uh, there are some points that can be built. Well, they have to be constructed from, from the pentagons um, and then some segments being built from, from those points. Um, and then using the polygon tool this was, um, filling in the, the gaps to create um, hidden some of the, um, the points in that case. So um, Ben showed how to hide the points using the points on the left-hand side. Um, and hiding the construction line. So I come up with this design at the end. Um, so this is a traditional Islamic decorative pattern. So um, nice. Um, I also, using the same construction, so this is kind of like a standalone design with tenfold symmetry, but using the same construction, I created a different polygon from the same points. Um, so it's this kind of like half, half a design um, and then doubled it using the rotation tool and then extended it. So this, because it's in the, the rhombus shape, it can be tessellated. Um, and then, you know, this is my kind of final, final piece for that one was a kind of black and white tiling pattern, which can be kind of um, decorated however you like. Um, and then, so that's one of the pieces. I'm gonna show you a couple more kind of for inspiration of things that I've done. So these are, um, some of them are based on um, Islamic traditional designs. Uh, the one on the top right, um, a decoration of a dome, um, but it's got really nice mathematical properties. Um, and I spent quite a lot of time um, working on how to do rather than because so a lot of the instructions I found were very much use the compass and ruler and do this, do that. And then I was I kind of delving into the the you know the underlying geometry of it in order to be able to do it quicker in GeoGebra. Um, the bottom left one there is a random design of my own making. Um, as you know, we were looking at the stars earlier, so I believe that's a a star in a 12 pointed star um, and then tessellated well tr or translated I suppose yeah tiling um, and colored in a particular way and then on the bottom right I think that was another traditional Islamic design um, but also um, you know you can use some kind of mathematical constructions as well um, so here um, starting with something that I wouldn't be able to construct by hand um, this is a you know a nice spiral and then so um, some equations of lines, which I could have done, drawn geometrically, but in this case, I drew them algebraically essentially. Um, and then I kind of decorated it. So I filled in some intersection points and built up. So here I'm building circles. The center of the circle is on the spiral and the edge of the circle is at the center of my, uh, my screen. It's, it's actually the origin of the coordinate points. Um, and you know, then I decorated it in various ways. And again, I use the same construction. So here's one decorated version, um, but I could also go back to the construction points and redecorate them in a different way. So using the same kind of underlying structure in more than one way. And I quite like that about GeoGebra. It kind of gives you that flexibility. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some formatting that I can do in GeoGebra, some of the formatting and decorative work I've done outside, but the, the being able to capture these kind of very mathematical shapes and patterns um, is what I've been using Georgia before. And um, just to kind of um, give you some idea, I thought we'd, um, this here is some animations that I've done. Um, this was actually kind of more for a demonstration, but I, you can imagine how we could use this artistically. 
Um, and then here's one that I was exploring. So some of the, the points in this are seen in, in geometric art, particularly Islamic art. And I wanted to kind of see how the family of, of shapes, you know, some other tiling shapes. Um, so it's quite, you know, being able to animate stuff, you can do kind of moving art. Um, and here's one, this was kind of based on a kind of retro poster. Um, and I quite like that being able to do randomized things. So that's the other thing with Jojibra that you can do generative art using some kind of randomized aspect. Um, I think, um, oh no, this here's another one. Oh, this was this was something we did in my class. So I've been running this class um, for the last 10 weeks and I've got another class that's just started. So we're doing it online and um, we're, yeah, we're going through various designs and learnings and tools that go along with it. Um, so it's quite it's quite a good quite a good introduction, I think, to GeoGebra and gives some kind of purpose to the learning. So, you know, a bit more structured if if you kind of prefer that kind of learning. So I'll leave my contact details. I'm intending to start another course um, in January at a time that would be good for UK people. Um, so if you drop me a message, I will um, put you on a waiting list and let you know when bookings are open for that. Um, I found teaching Jojo online mostly good, um, but as, as Ben said, you know, not being able to stand over and watch what someone's doing um, has been challenging. And I haven't used GeoGebra Classroom because it does have limitations. And I mentioned okay. in the chat, but I much prefer um, the classic five, um, particularly for art because it's got good exporting um, facilities, basically. That's my main, um, it's my main thing that I, I really, tried out in six and couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get on board with. <laughs> Everyone has their preferences, I think. Um, I, if, you, if you're interested in the kind of the artistic stuff, we've kind of started a GeoGebra art hashtag. So feel free to kind of peruse that to see what, you know, we've been doing in class or people have been in the class have then gone on to do. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been really good. I've really enjoyed teaching it. And I think that, you know, it's covered quite a lot of um, the basic tools. So if you, you know, if you want to have a look at GeoGebra, um, some of the art stuff is a place where you could start. Um, um, yeah, I think I, I think I'm nearly done with all my. Oh, I did have one last thing I wanted to show. Um, I'm going to have to uh, do something else in a minute, but um, I wanted to quickly show. Um, I'm going to. I think I've got to do a new share. Let's try this. So this was something that I um, invented recently. Um, so one of the things that Jojibra has is a spreadsheet. Um, so I thought perhaps I could use the spreadsheet to create some interesting thing. Um, and let's see if I can get this right. So I've, I've, I'm creating a slider right now. So in, in the same way that Ben used the slider for his um, White Cause MX plus C, um, I'm going to create a little slider with some options. So my slider goes between naught and one. Okay, and then in my spreadsheet, um, so here, are, these are just descriptions of the points that I've already created. Um, I'm then going to, um, I can draw a line draw a polygon using the kind of commands. What's amazing to me is that the spreadsheet in Jojo is fully functional and includes all of Jojo's commands in it. And once you realize that the sort of the potential is just amazing. Yeah, I seem to have uh, typed something wrong. What have I done? Oh, polygon A2, B2, C2. It tells me it's not a polygon. C2 is a point. Um, there we go. Um, so the nice thing about this, obviously, is if, if you've clearly made a mistake, you can usually go back and fix it. So I've typed in the points A, B, and C here, um, and I've created the polygon. So now what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to show you where the function is so that I can um, type it in and you can all see it. So here, I want to create a point, and I want it to be um, between A and B. And so... Um, uh, I've just got to, so I want it to be, um, 
based on the cells in the in the in the um, spreadsheet. So A two um, plus A lots of um, B two minus A two. Now let me just check them, and hopefully it slides along um, that side, which it does. Good. Okay. Nice. And so I'm going to do the same over here. And so I've got a point that slides up and down that side. And then I kind of want to do the same here, except there's going to be an error because I don't want it at point D2. I want to go back round my triangle. So as we find, we've got this nice, these three points which move proportionally along, um, along those edges. So now what I can do is I can say, okay, I'm going to, you know, like in a spreadsheet, drag down my polygon. And uh, some of you might have some idea where this is going. So with these quick commands, I can just you know, drag down a few times and I get something beautiful like this. Yeah. And my favorite thing about this really is, you know, that you can play with the slider, but also, you know, if I want to rearrange how my original triangle was, um, I can move those points around. So I think that's I think that's done done with my demos. Um, Thank you, so Becky. Yeah, there's a little um, a little. If you want to do, if you want to join my math art, uh, my algebra art class, do drop us a line. I'll put you on the waiting list. Um, but there are plenty of other people who are doing great things out there with algebra. Um, and Alison is um, online, and she told me she was going to be running a algebra workshop um, upcoming. Um, sometime in December, didn't you say, Alison? Um, so um, I'm sure she will keep everyone posted on that as well. Check the hashtag, follow me on um, Twitter. <laughs> oh, sorry, Alison. I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I've just uh, dumped you in it, sorry. Um, so at Twitter, I'm Becky K. Warren. Um, and uh, my email address is, um, I'll put my email address in the while Becky's typing that, I, I know that Becky has to go very shortly. If there are questions, particularly for her, we're going to have a little bit longer to tinker and I'll do some other demos for you if anyone's still around. But before Becky goes, now is the time to get your questions in the chat for Becky or jump on a microphone, to be honest, because there's not loads of us here. I hope that's okay, Becky, if you've got a couple of minutes to see if there's anyone wanted to ask you anything based on what you've shown yeah, us. five more minutes I've got. Turns out Becky has to do real work. Can I just kind of ask time. John Bibby here? There's one specific question, but the, the context is um, this is a project I've rather parked because I've got myself in several dead ends, some of them technological. And this has been very useful. It's helped me brush off some sort of 10 year old cobwebs from my uh, knowledge of GeoGebra. But um, I'm trying to build a bridge between, on the one hand, statistical visualizations where you've got data. And on the other hand, things like a generalized version of Ulam Spiral, which um, I'm sure you know about. And the technology I want is in Excel, and I'm just wondering whether it's here. It's uh, to, to have a spreadsheet in which you can get the cells basically square, and then you can color the cells according to the value that is in the cell. Is that something you can do in GeoGebra? Do you want to tackle that, Becky? Well, I'm not sure. I haven't really played with that the spreadsheet functionality in that way, but potentially. I think what John is referring to is conditional formatting, which certainly exists in Excel. Um, yeah. I don't think it works in the GeoGebra spreadsheet, but what the GeoGebra spreadsheet has an advantage for is that anything you put in a spreadsheet could be represented in the graphics view visually. So there'd be a way to make those cells refer to something in a coordinate axis, but not quite as simple as coloring the cells according to what's in there. That, that you're probably better off staying in Excel. Excel is still a valid spreadsheet. I think. Uh, yeah, there's other things I want to do that I can't do in Excel. But anyhow, I might come back to you with an Excel question. Thank you very much. There's, I don't know if Becky's found this, but there's almost certainly, if someone says, can George do such and such? The answer is yes, but uh, you've just <laughs> got to find the right button. Yeah. Or if you can't find the right button, you write to Michael Borshards, who's the lead developer of George and say, I wish George would do this. And right. usually within yes. 20 minutes, he responds on Twitter and says, yeah, just update your version. Yeah. I'm well, kind well, of well, that's, exaggerating that's slightly. Than, but, you know, the answers I've had so far is, oh, John, it's easy. You can write it in Python. Uh, but for that, I have to brush away yeah. my Python cobwebs. <laughs> I feel those cobwebs as well. GeoGebra is like learning a programming language. That similarity is, is quite strong, but it's kind of geometrical programming language on an algebraic programming language, more of which I'll show in a minute. Before Becky has to go, uh, thanks for your question, John. I'm sorry we can't answer it satisfactorily yet. Anything else for, for Becky before she goes? 
Katie has just put a comment. You can make points change color based on their properties. It's called dynamic coloring. And I can show an example of that in a moment uh, if needed. Questions for Becky are um, now, now is the time. You can always email me questions if you've got anything that comes up later. Um, always happy to hear from Jodie fans. I thoroughly recommend following Becky on Twitter, even if it's just to see nice artwork regularly animating all over your Twitter feed. It's wonderful. And I haven't done her course yet on using art to make Jojibra, but even if you're happy with Jojibra, being sort of given the discipline of making art with it is a really good way to get better at anything. And that, that's true, whether it's Jojibra or using paints, so, so I'm told. But um, Becky is one of the leading lights of making nice art on Jojibra with, in Twitter. And so go and follow her, I think. Probably just um, worth saying as well how pleasing that was just to watch. So thank you very, very much, Becky. That totally made my day. Did I did I say it the wrong way around? Kevin's just asking, using art to make Jojibra? That's clearly why Jojibra exists. It's, it's an artistic <laughs> creation. It is. Becky, yeah. anything you want to say before we, we leave you to your um, real job? No, this has been this has been really lovely though. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll just, you know, start a YouTube streaming where I just do things on Jojibra and you can just like have it on in the background as a kind of relaxation. You know? I genuinely think there's a market for that. Let's keep moving because I want to give people another chance to vote on what else they want okay, to ask well, about. Becky, people. thank you. And uh, yeah, Becky over Thanks, in California everyone. has to start a real day of work now. We officially, uh, these previous sessions have been running for an hour. We did warn, I hope you got the message that this one might run a bit longer. I have got other demos I can show, but I don't want to do things that are irrelevant for people. So I think I would like to give you a vote on what I show you next. You are, of course, free to leave at any point if you are uh, Jojibrud out, although I don't know how that happens. It's never happened to me. Or well, actually have real world things to do. Well, there's, a, there's always that. So I, I'm just going to, there are several things I'd like to show. Um, Katie mentioned to me in a private message, and I think it is worth demonstrating, that you, you can do colouring things. And the other thing I haven't mentioned a lot of is that the, the name Jojibra is a portmanteau of geometry and algebra. And a lot of what we've talked about so far is more geometrical. And I want to point out that the algebraic functions in GeoGebra are strong and fundamentally integrated with the geometry, and that's what makes it strong. And I would like to demo something of that. But I would, if I put this poll up, I'm, I'm actually going to share uh, four options that I've just written in Word. So let's just do this. Um, are you seeing uh, uh, four options with, with four words? And I wonder if we could start a poll. Would you like me to... Do a demo that involves something to do with the Mandelbrot set. Uh, do a demo that involves something with Sunflower Spirals. And those two are demos. I won't necessarily talk about how I built those files, although I can do if there's long enough. Uh, I would also like to show you things to do that are much more sort of algebraic. So the gradient function, which is code for differentiation, maybe from first principles, and maybe a Maclaurin or Taylor series. These are not necessarily... Um, enrichment ideas, but they are nice ways of visualizing bits of maths that you might already know about, but seeing them move makes a difference. And those two I can build from scratch uh, live in front of you at quite some speed, but remember this is being recorded. So if you would like to vote, um, why is the poll not working? That's interesting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch it again. Hopefully you're now able to vote one of those things. I, I'm not gonna take this as gospel. I won't commit myself to doing all of these, but if, if two of them are sort of sharing the vote, I'll try and do those two before we finish. And I'll make sure that I leave a little bit of time before 5.30 for some further questions. There are lots of things to learn about GeoGebra, but as long as you don't treat this as your only chance to learn it, then you'll be fine. This is an introduction to GeoGebra in the end. The, uh, I'm gonna give a couple more seconds to the voting. Several people, uh, the, at the moment, you can't see the results, but at the moment the gradient function construction is winning, but the votes are spread around all of those options. So I think I'm gonna start by showing you a gradient function construction. And if we have time, I'll do another demo, possibly of, possibly the McLaurin series. That's also doing well on the votes. Um, and there'll be time for further questions as well. So let me stop sharing a screen. Sam, are you happy for me to carry on with the demo? I'm just checking that there's nothing else burning in the chat that needs to be addressed. Okay. Uh, I, Alison is commenting about singing Smash Mouth. That's an entirely different workshop. Okay, uh, I'm trying Wait, to- Wait, you do a workshop on that? <laughs> Not yet, but you know, say the word and send me, uh, send me money and 
I will pollute your ears. I am hopefully sharing a blank GeoGebra screen once again. Give me a nod if you're seeing that. Okay, quick context. Uh, the vote was strongest for the gradient function construction. So I'm going to construct a, a file which allows me to talk about what the gradient of a function might mean, particularly for students or just generally interested people who are used to gradients being of straight lines and not of curved functions. So the algebraic things of GeoGebra are strong. I can do functions. I can type f of x equals. I'm going to pick x cubed subtract x, which is a nice curvy looking function. A couple of things about GeoGebra to realize using a mouse wheel. And again, this is why I like the downloaded version that the keyboard shortcuts are better, but I could just zoom in. So I'm scrolling my mouse wheel to zoom in. There are zoom tools, but you don't need to click on them. Just use a mouse wheel. Um, you can change the scale. Cubic functions tend to go quickly. I want to spread this out. If I just drag around the screen, I'm moving it. But if I hold down shift, you can't see me holding down shift. And I drag one of the axes, you can change the scale of one axis. And that's quite a crucial keyboard shortcut to be able to scale what you see to fit nicely. Uh, and actually, I want to go up again, maybe there. So there's, there's a nice curvy bit of a cubic function. I'm going to create a point on this function. I'm going to use the point tool. If you use the point tool on a background, you just create a point. But if I put a point on the function, it makes a point on the function, and it only moves on the function. That's already quite useful. What I'd really like to know is what's the gradient of this function. and to do that, we have to realize that it's going to change because it's curved. It's not a straight line. There is a tangent tool in GeoGebra. So if I click on the third option here, the tangent tool is here. If I don't know how to use it, I can hover over it, select point or line, then circle conical function. It's a little bit cryptic, to be honest. But in this case, it's really saying pick a point and then a function. And it will do all the tangent to that function at that point. In this case, that point, this function, boom. And it moves. And to be honest, if I didn't like drag it around, I right click on it and click animate on. And I just again, I walk away and let people watch this. Already, I think we have a fertile discussion of what the gradient of a curved function is. Because it's moving, it's capturing all the generality at once. And I could go on about this. I really think we have responsibility as educators and demonstrators of mathematics to make it move because we haven't been able to do that in previous generations of maths outreach. But now it's free and Georgia and Desmos and all those things. I am aware this is not yet the gradient function. What I'd like to do is track the gradient of this function at a particular point. And there's a couple of subtleties. So I'm gonna stop the animation just for now. I'm gonna maybe drag it back up here. There's a command buried in GeoGebra, which it took me ages to find and it's brilliant, but it's not in the help files because it's so basic. And that command is how to grab the X coordinate or in fact, the Y coordinate of a point on your screen. I would like to get the X coordinate of A because that's kind of where I am in the function. And the command for that is X brackets A. Uh, it's such a short command that it's really not in there. But if I press return on that, you can see it's made a little thing in the algebra window here, negative 0.8, which is roughly where the x coordinate is. I didn't need to make that. I could have just used the command x of a whenever I want to grab the x coordinate of a. What I would like to do is plot the point which has the same x coordinate as a, but in fact has the same y coordinate as the slope of that line. So to do it a long way around, there's a slope tool, which is nice. Remember what I said about GeoGebra? If you're wondering, can it do that? The answer is yes. Probably it's in one of these buttons. And if it's not, it might be in a command. There's literally thousands of commands buried in there. I'm not going to expand all these. There's loads of commands in here. And you can start typing them. For example, if you start typing that, you get a list of command options coming up. There's a lot to explore here. We can't do it all today. What I really want is the slope command. And there is a button. There's also a command for it. And I want the slope of this line. And you can see it's drawn me the slope of that line, which is nice. And it changes as we move around. It's drawn the sort of gradient triangle. And it's given it a value m. That's presumably because of the old mx plus c convention. In that case, though, what I would like to do is plot a coordinate which has the x coordinate the same as a, but its y coordinate is in fact the gradient, i.e. m. And this is the sort of subtle bit. Just type it in. I would like a coordinate that's normally got two brackets. I would like the x bit to be x of a. I would like the y coordinate to be the number n. There's no command for this. I just type it in. Once you realize the judge would just lets you build what you want, then you start seeing the potential power here uh, and it's going to move. So as I drag A, you can see B moves. And I hope you recognize what sort of shape it's moving in. Just to save a bit of time, I'm going to animate A. Uh, and you can see that B is moving in what I might call the gradient function of the cubic curve. I hope you recognize what shape B is. It would be lovely if we could leave B sort of making a trace, wouldn't it? Good. Luckily, GeoGebra can do that. Right click on B, turn on the trace. And as it comes back on the screen, you'll see B leaving a track wherever it goes. I hope. Here it comes. 
we. I don't know why I said we. It feels like a nice movie name. Okay, cut a long story short, I've basically differentiated the cubic function by tracking the gradient of the cubic function, and lo and behold, it looks like a quadratic function. There's a lot to talk about. You can imagine teaching this is quite powerful. The movement is good. Uh, one other command, though, you might uh, want in GeoGebra is, first of all, the trace function is very ephemeral. It disappears as soon as you move around. It's just a really sort of, it, it's there until you drag, and then it vanishes. What I'd like is a sort of more concrete version, and to do that, there's a locus command. This is surprisingly useful. Anything that moves as a result of something else moving, you can leave a permanent trace if you like. So this locus command asks for, selects a locus point and then a point on an object or a slider. In this case, the point that you want to trace out and the point that controls it. So in this case, I want to trace out B as A moves. There it is. And that is the gradient function as a locus. To cut the long story short, uh, I could change the original function. Double click this, let's make it sine X. What will the gradient function be? It will be cosine x. And because I've constructed it, everything updates as I change the original inputs. Uh, obviously, we have to deal with the fact that we're working in radians here. I'm not going to tackle that unless anyone wants me to talk about degrees versus radians later on. Nice way to explore it. Final thing, though, GeoGebra is actually an algebraic program as well. This I've kind of constructed this geometrically by talking about coordinates, but it will actually differentiate a function. f is sine x. I can type in f dashed of x and it will plot it anyway. So if I hide the locus and everything else, you can see that it knows the differential of sine is cosine and everything else. So GeoGebra can do differentiation actually analytically as well. In fact, it has a computer algebra system built into it under the cast thing here, but that's another can of worms which I don't want to open right now because we will need all night. <laughs> and I don't have all night. All I've done here is build a gradient function construction. And actually I feel like doing this live, actually building the construction in front of an audience, has a little bit more value than presenting a finished file like this. But the classroom link I shared earlier does have a finished version of this gradient function thing. And if you want to follow that classroom link, I'll make sure it's unpaused after this session. You can go and have a play with my demonstration file and maybe try and build your own version. Obviously, you could just do that on your standalone copy of GeoGebra as well, but I'll make sure the demo file for this is available. So I promised I'd do that one. Um, are there any questions about this gradient function construction or anything you wish that it could do now we've built this? Anything else you want to ask? I've got more demos in me, but uh, I don't want to overload you. But uh, by the way, if you want to ask a question, it's probably quicker to jump on the microphone than in the chat, and you're welcome just to jump on the mic and ask me anything you want. Yeah, I was, I was going to be wrangling the questions, but we haven't got questions in the chat. So uh, yeah, just, just feel free to uh, ask Ben a question. I'm interested in um, what people didn't know already. Who I know that Alison and Sam have used GeoGebra before, but there's a few things like that shift drag is, is a useful tip. I'm glad that was new. Uh, Sam has written down the summary of the that X coordinate piece of advice is really, really helpful to get a piece of algebra out of a point. Okay, the, the second demonstration that won on the vote was the McLaurin Taylor series. And since that is a construction I can do from scratch, I will, I will try and do that in the next five minutes. And then we've officially got quarter of an hour for any other questions. And if you want me just to do more demos, you know, uh, I did warn everyone that uh, we could be here all night, but I will finish at half past unless someone wants to pay me to stay over. No. Ben, are yes. you able to build into whatever you're going to show us the bit that Katie mentioned about being able to dynamic coloring for points? That's a very good point. So let me show you the demo file for this one I build, which I spent a little bit more time prettying up and including some dynamic coloring. I'm going to stop sharing this and share you my demo file. I mean, there's a lot to be said for the difference between one you build on the fly and the one you spend time prettying up, uh, which is my code for paying attention to the aesthetics. Okay, let me just share the right thing here. Sharing my second screen. This is the, uh, the gradient function demo. Give me a nod if you're seeing a more complicated looking screen. Okay, in the online, you can always upload online resources to GeoGebra and then they're free to share. You can see this thing is, is animating away, I hope, in a similar way, but I've done a little bit more care and attention. You can see some tick boxes exist and I've got an input box to change the function. I've got sort of, I can click the trace on, I can show B and that uh, turns on B. Now something else is happening with the coloring of that B point and that's what I want to demo. Although one other comment is that when you upload a file to GeoGebra, there's always this little button on the bottom right, which maximizes it onto a screen. And that's really useful for demonstrating in a classroom or 
when you're sharing over Zoom because it sort of fills the available space. So can you just uh, confirm to me by nodding on the video again, if you are seeing this animating file now and the trace seems to change color. Uh, was it Fran who asked about the changing color? So Fran, what you'll notice is that I've made the point B, which is my gradient trace, change color at a certain point. And I wonder if it's obvious to everyone when it changes color. Jump on the mic and tell me, just, I need some interaction at this point. When does it's it change it's color? positive or negative. Yeah, and when you said it, uh, I know you mean the gradient of the original function. And the reason I've done that is if I was trying to get a class introduced to the concept of gradient, I might, before I end up tracing B, and I'm going to just turn off that trace now, I might ask them to sort of put their hands up whenever they think the gradient is positive and then put them down when it's negative and just get the whole class doing that. And even an audience, if I was going to do that. And it's kind of a fun way to force them to engage with the dynamic nature. So hand up and down. And it's still down, it's still down, and now it's up again. And it forces them to realize when it's positive and negative. And then I can capture that by showing B, that point I've made, and I've made it change color when that changes. So how did I do that? Let me quickly show you that. Uh, to do that, I need to get hold of B. If you right click on anything in GeoGebra, as long as you're in a sort of decent version of GeoGebra and it's not sort of locked down web version, then you can get to the properties of the thing. And the web version is a bit clunky. It kind of takes up loads of screen space, which is another reason why I like the downloaded version. But in the advanced tab of the properties, there are some dynamic colors options. And the crucial thing is here, if you understand about RGB values, you can change it to HSV values. That's just a way of specifying a color. The way you can specify the color can have variables in it. And in this case, the variable A is involved. And I've got a situation here where A is, I think, 100. I've chosen that. Um, and let's have a look at what A is. A is an if statement. I've made it if the gradient is 0, bigger than 0, then A is 100. And if it is not bigger than 0, A becomes 0. So this is a sort of almost a command in a programming language. It's actually a GeoGebra command, an if statement. You have to get used to that. But then I'm using that value A to determine the properties of the color of B. Jumping back to that, you can see that when A is 100, that becomes 1, and the others become 0, I think. And then when A is 0, that becomes 0, and these become 100. So it changes from fully red to a mixture of green and blue, which apparently is whatever color it is. <laughs> which, being slightly colorblind, I'm not sure. What color is that? Teal? Should we go teal? I'm just guessing word. Aqua. That's a new word for me. Good. So um, I realized that was not a comprehensive tutorial, but the fact that there is a dynamic coloring option buried in the settings is kind of what you need to know and then go and play with it and make it change based on another variable. Everything on GeoGebra is based on variables. Almost everything you can type into, you can set, you can type in a number or you could type in a variable that changes based on something else changing. The other thing to mention is that I've done some tick boxes. Uh, someone, I think, uh, who was it in the uh, was it Claire in the chat was saying tick boxes look complicated. There is a tool for tick boxes and it's relatively easy to use. There is a slight catch in how it does it behind the scenes, but to cut a long story short, every func every object has a property buried behind it. So I'm going to get the properties of this function x, f sorry. And in the advanced tab, there is a condition to show the object. And what you actually build with a tick box is a Boolean, a true or false, whether it's ticked or not. And you make that tick or cross change this thing here. And that's how to change a hide or show thing. But the, tech, the tick box button in here actually does that for you, um, which Katie learned the hard way by doing it really the proper way behind the scenes and then realizing there is eventually a shortcut to it. Happy to explain that more later on. Um, I said I'd do one more demo, but since that question from Fran was a helpful way to make sure I said I'd do what I said about the colouring, any other questions in that vein while I'm demoing this? Ben, in the number um, there, you used an if statement. Yes. Can you do that in point definitions and in other places as well? Can you do it yes. anywhere? Remember, th mm. the questions that start with, can GeoGebra do? Yes. Yes, they can. So I could create a point which is, if, if m is greater than zero, I could create a point at one comma zero. I don't, this is, I don't know why you'd want to. And if it's not, make a point at two comma zero. What I'm doing is writing an if statement there that depends on m and will create a point at one comma zero or at two comma zero. Uh, 
based on that thing. So I'm kind of making points come out of the if statement. So if I if I do that, you can see that point C is turned up, and it will jump over there. Uh, so the the that point C depends on an if statement I've built. Once you realize that sort of power is available, you realize this is a proper programming language. In fact, everything in GeoGebra is a command in this input bar. What they've actually done is make the tools at the top shortcuts for some commands. But there's a lot of tools available that are not picture tools, but they are in the command bar available. Uh, some really complicated stuff, one of which I'll show you in a moment to do with a Taylor series expansion. There is no button for that at the top. But that's a really nice question from Sam. If statements are powerful and you can use them for anything. Any other questions on this one? I am rushing you through GeoGebra 101 here. All Katie's called the color cyan, just to update you on that. I'm just uh, catching up. Okay, I'd like to do one more demo and then I'm gonna stop demoing at you, even though I love it so much. Keep the questions coming. You you are of course free just to interrupt me at any point just to uh, ask me something interesting. I'm gonna start with a brand new Joe's profile, and I'm going to share that with you now. Can you see how much I'm sweating on the camera? Shouldn't have, shouldn't have pointed that out. Should I? Okay, give me a nod if you're seeing a blank looking Joe's profile again. Lovely. Okay, this time I'm going to create a Let's let's do let's do sine x again. I think that's a good function to play with, and I want to point out that you can create a series. This is a function which is clearly not a polynomial, but you can pretend that it is a polynomial. For example, the polynomial y equals x is quite close to it. Can you see that? I, I, I realize it's not very obviously the same. It doesn't wiggle, but if I zoom in close enough, they're actually ridiculously close. And if you didn't know already uh, that sine x is approximated quite well by the function x at small values, then now you can see it visually. It's better approximated by the function x subtract x cubed over three. Because it's got kind of the wiggles in the same place. Now it's not perfect, but actually does a little bit better than straight line, although not a lot better. Um, so why is that better? And how could I come up with other polynomials that make it? Well, that's the whole point of a Taylor series or a Maclaurin series. And if you teach A-level maths, that's, that's when they first meet it. But it's a really lovely thing that even functions which are not polynomials can indeed be polynomials. And GeoGebra can do this for you. And the fact that it's just a command, I love. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a slider, uh, which I'm going to call n. And this is going to be the number of terms I'm going to create for the polynomial. I'm going to let it go from 0 up to, I don't know, 30. And I'm gonna, I'd like it to go up in ones. So you can see this button, the, this option box for sliders lets you define a slider to do whatever you want. You can see that slides from one, zero to 30. It doesn't do anything, it's just a slider at the moment. But now I'm gonna type in the magic. I'm gonna start typing the word Taylor and you can see that it, ah, would you like a Taylor polynomial? <laughs> yes, George, bro. Yes, I would. Uh, you can press return to select the functions or you can use arrow keys if there's more than one available from the suggestions. In this case, it's asking for a function, an x value, and an order number. The function I want to use is my f, which I defined earlier, so I'm just typing f. I would like to expand it around zero, which is incidentally what they call a uh, Maclaurin series when a Taylor series expands around zero. Let's not worry about that. Uh, and then I'm going to say how many terms I would like in the polynomial. That's the n I made earlier. I've left it parked on 11 for no good reason, but let's just type in n. And there we have it. One other tip. Any algebraic representation on the left, if I would like it visible on the screen, I can just drag that onto the screen. And there I've got the algebraic version of this function. Here's the original one. So sine x and that polynomial are remarkably similar. If I zoom out, you can see that they're, they're pretty good. I'm just going to stop these moving around by clicking absolute position on the screen. And you're all dying to see what happens when I change the slider. If I reduce the number of terms, you can see the polynomial gets worse and worse. Starts off at zero. There's the one we talked about earlier. There's the cubic one. Um, Oh, it's three factorial. That's why it was rubbish earlier. No one pointed out my error. And if I keep dragging, I love that oscillation. I mean, I knew about McLaurin and Taylor series, but the first time I saw this little animation, which you can build in about 30 seconds flat, I was like, that's why the more terms you've got, it's better. And actually, if you look at other polynomials, for example, uh, someone give me another polynomial, uh, e to the x. Let's change the original function to be e to the x. And you can see that this also gets better and better, but the right-hand side is always pretty good. It's just the left-hand side that's oscillating in a, in a slightly kind of weird and comical way. I'm not, I'm not sure I find that funny, but I kind of do. 
Um, the reason I want to demo this is this is a fundamentally algebraic and sort of calculus based topic, but GeoGebra really helps you demonstrate it. And it's doing that because it's good at algebra and it has that Taylor command and you can make things move. You can generalize things and that visual approximation of things with movement involved helps all of us understand what's going on as things change. Okay, end of demo. Time for questions if you want any. I'm just gonna leave this animating. Ed, I'm sorry to monopolize. Before you go, I've got a bit Not of a sort of meta question I'd like to ask. Not specific to this. Ask it now, and I'll tell you if okay. I think it's worth ask, answering in front of everyone. And if it's not, okay. then I'll, I'll loiter for five minutes at the end and we'll yeah. tackle it. Uh, yesterday, I went to an autograph seminar. Good. Autograph uh, is also getting better and better. Right. And um, having been, to, uh, that was wiping away some autograph cobwebs. Um, and after them both, I've come to the conclusion more or less that I don't need both of them. Now, firstly, <laughs> is that correct? I mean, is there anything that one does that the other doesn't and vice versa? And secondly, sort of personal preferences aside, can you put your finger on anything that Autograph does that GeoGebra doesn't or vice versa? That is, I think, a worthwhile question to answer now to everybody, unless there are other burning questions. Um, I will comment on this because it is a common concern. Like, basically, other packages are available. <laughs> That's the important headline here. We chose to focus on one today because actually, if I tried to demonstrate three different packages, and I'm thinking of three particular different packages in my head, which I'll say in a moment, there's no way we could show you the, the depth of all of them. So it may be that we should run another session on Autograph and we should not run another session on Desmos having just done one on GeoGebra. Those three, I think, are worth knowing about. GeoGebra is free. It now works in a browser and online and downloaded and, and on a phone. Desmos is free. It works in a browser, not as a downloaded version, but it does work on a phone. Autograph is now free thanks to, I think, Complete Maths. Um, mm. And they're doing lots of work on Autograph. And so here's mm. a quick potted summary of which ones are useful for what. Autograph was the first one to get 3D mode that functioned. Mm -hmm. Changed our worlds if you've played with lots of 3D things. In my opinion, GeoGebra 3D mode is now superior. Autograph still has a very good 3D mode, and Desmos doesn't, for example. So there's one comparison between the two. Um, if you were going to use Desmos to plot complex numbers, it's difficult. GeoGebra has them built in. For a long time, Autograph didn't, but now it does. So Autograph has caught up on that. Uh, GeoGebra was it. If you want to do simple graphing desmos is a very clean interface it works very naturally and instinctively um, but if you want to do complicated functions like i've been modeling say the taylor polynomial here desmos won't do that and i don't know if autograph will do that i suspect there would be a way to make it happen yeah my now getting away from facts i find autograph less intuitive and I find the fact that all the commands are available in GeoGebra, I can go and look at the help file a bit more intuitive. But that could just be a product of the fact that I've spent more time with it. So mm -hmm. I think all those three are worth knowing about. They're all getting better all the time. And now they're all free. So choose one and dust the cobblers off and don't stress too much about it, is my summary. Yeah, thank you. Right, right. Okay. okay, Ben, uh, I'm going to have to stop you there because we're going to run out of time uh, quite soon because there, there were a couple of things we, you know, we, we were going to say. Um, and we're also going to... Uh, Sam was going to say something, Sam Hartburn was going to say something. I mean, we, we, we kind of... Uh, yeah, wanna... good point. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a shame Becky didn't hang around really, because I did Becky's um, online GeoGebra course, and I just wanted to tell you how fantastic it was. Um, I'd done a fair bit of GeoGebra stuff before, but I learned lots of new tricks to make things more efficient and to do things quicker. But the main thing was it's just really inspiring. She showed us lots more designs than she showed us today. Obviously, it was a 10 meet course. And um, just lots of really inspiring designs um, enabled me to go on and do lots of new and different things. And yeah, really highly recommend, highly recommend it. It was a really nice social thing as well, um, just to get together with other people who liked playing with GeoGebra and like playing with art. And we share our designs on Twitter and uh, work on things together it's just been a really nice thing to do so yeah definitely sign up if uh, when if when she wants another one let me back that up by saying i didn't do becky's course but watching the output from sam Hartburn, for example on twitter shows me what an amazing course it is because i can see lots of people having a really good time making amazing stuff and loving doing so and if you want to go i think second following suggestion follow sam Hartburn because some uh, some of the art she's produced off the back of becky's course is is lovely and it's just worth looking at Indeed, indeed. Oh, so, thanks, Ben. 
Yes, thanks, Sam. Um, so I, I think we really should wrap it up. So uh, thanks to Becky, who's uh, unfortunately uh, had, had to, uh, has got herself a job now. So, um, uh, well, sorry, a, a, a job. Another job. <laughs> Another job. It's not freelancing. Yes. I mean, that's. Uh, it's yeah, it's freelancing. Um, yeah. Um, so, yes, thanks to Ben and Becky. Um, there are a couple of things I should say. The last video that we did, uh, or rather last session that we did, we've got it on video. It is up on the YouTube channel, um, but unfortunately it doesn't have the proper um, uh, captions on it yet because we haven't had time. So if anybody wants to volunteer and do the captions, um, then if they could, please, that'd be fantastic. Um, so volunteers for that. Next time we've got inclusivity in maths communication. So that'll probably be towards the end of November. Um, so probably a month from now, more or less, and we'll uh, look, well, look out on the, the email uh, that we send around for that. I think I should just end by saying, well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming and uh, asking your questions. And um, I'm sure Ben um, will, will be available for questions uh, by, by email. Um, I'll loiter for a couple of minutes now, although well, I won't stay too long if anyone needs to. I'll loiter a few minutes, because as we, we've got an important insight into Ben's mind that... Uh, Art is there for doing GeoGebra. Well, that's that's uh, important insight, I think, for, to Ben. I, I don't right, see the so, contradiction. <laughs> so, so, so thanks very much for everybody. And I think, as, as Ben says, he'll be he'll be hanging around uh, for five minutes or so if you want any more. But anyway, thanks all for coming, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>